Hi everybody, okay, welcome back. We are looking today at the subject of participles, taking another look at some of the material in Jeremy Duff's book, uh, Elements of New Testament Greek, we're in section 7.5, and today we're going to explore how participles can be used as nouns. Now, just to recap and remind you a couple of things from a couple of previous videos, we saw uh, two videos ago, I think, that participles are verbal adjectives. That is, they're a little bit like verbs and they're a little bit like adjectives. They come from a verb stem and they have a tense like a verb, but they also have uh, number and gender and case like an adjective does. And so they kind of uh, cover both those bases, so to speak, in the grammatical world. Well, if you think back to when we were looking at uh, adjectives, we discovered that you can turn adjectives into a noun simply by popping the article in front of it. So um, if you think of the Beatitudes in uh, Matthew chapter 5, uh, blessed are the meek. Well, meek is an adjective, but the meek we recognise even in English. It's not quite so common as in Greek, but nonetheless we recognise it by adding the meek. Uh, uh, the word the in front of meek turns the adjective into a description of a category of people who have that property about them, meek ones. Well, Greek does that uh, very frequently, and because it does it with adjectives, and because a participle is a kind of an adjective, it's a verbal adjective, you can do it with participles as well. And that's what Duff explains here, and he gives you a couple of examples. The sower, uh, the person who is sowing, uh, uh, the other example he gives, um, those who have heard, the having heard ones. In both those cases, uh, both those instances, what you're doing is you're simply adding a, a, an article um, to the participle to turn it into uh, uh, a phrase, which means the ones who are doing this action, denoted by the participle. The best way to explain it is just to look at a couple of these examples which are right there, practice 7.5. Let's jump straight into them and we also see a couple of other things here which are useful just to bear in mind as you're exploring other uh, translation exercises and texts you've got to look at. Let's look then first at number one, hopempsas auton soze. Hopempsas auton soze. Okay, well what do we do? As always we find the verb. The verb is right here. It comes from sozo, meaning I save. This is third person singular because of a at the ending, so therefore it means uh, he or she or it saves. Okay, so he saves. Um, we look now for the subject, you're looking for a noun in the nominative, and so you cast your eyes around and you see a nice uh, chunky uh, nominative masculine uh, singular article, so you think fantastic, that's going to be attached to the noun in the nominative, and then you recoil in horror and shock because you think, hold on, pempsas, that comes from uh, pempo, which isn't a noun at all, it's a verb. What on earth is an article doing attached to a verb? And then you remember, hold on, we're looking at participles, which can be used as nouns. You turn a participle into a noun by adding the article to it. So, ho pempsas is, well, something to do with the one who is sending or the one who sent. We're going to have to look at that in a second. Now, just to parse this properly, it's got the sigma suffix, which is combined with the uh, pi at the end of the stem to give you this psi, and then the as ending. Uh, that's the aorist nominative singular participle of pempo. So it means, if you're just going to gloss pempsas, it's present, it will be sending, uh, uh, aorist will be having sent. So pempsas, let's gloss that as having sent. Just a reminder of that one, look back in the previous video or the one before that if you need a reminder, but the present participle conveys the idea of happening at the same time as the main verb, hence sending, the aorist participle uh, happening before the main verb, so having sent, okay, um, and this one is the having sent. Right, so what do we, how do we make sense of this? Now at this point, um, there's a little hint box two thirds of the way down page 87 in Duff's book, which is very useful. He's encouraging you to add other words, particularly words like who, um, but we'll look at other words as well, just to make sense of what this says or to turn it into good English. But think first about how to construct its meaning just by looking at this. The one is one of it, let's put the one, having sent. It's the one who has the property of having sent something. So how do we say that in English? We probably say something like the one who sent. Or maybe 
um, the sender. The one who sent or the sender. That's probably how we'd put it in English. So let's leave it with those options all live on the table. Never rush to pick just one possible meaning if you're translating something you're not sure what it means. Leave all the options live so that you don't get too constrained too early on in the process. You keep all the possibilities open. What else we got left in the sentence? Okay, the one who sent saves. Well, that's going to be the subject of the verb. What on earth is this doing here then? Well, what we've got here is out on third person accusative singular masculine pronoun meaning him. And because it's accusative, it's going to be the object of a verb. So here's a question for you. Which verb is it the object of? You've got two verbs. You've got this participle, which is a kind of verb, a verbal adjective, and you've got this uh, in, uh, indicative verb, third person singular, he says. Which is it going to be the object of? Well, there are a couple of ways to come to the right conclusion here. One is a bit dodgy. One has a lot more rigour to it. Let me tell you the dodgy um, uh, approach to um, figuring it out first. The, the, the dodgy way is just to try and think which makes most sense in English. Now that's risky because what makes sense or what doesn't make sense um, might not be obvious to you or you might think something doesn't make sense when in fact it does. But let's just have a look at it. Um, if this is the object of saves, then we have a sentence which says, the one who sent saves him with him as the object of saves. Well, that's just about possible, I suppose. Um, if we make him the object of the participle, on the other hand, then we have a sentence that says something like, the one who sent him saves. And just on the face of it, meaning-wise, that's more plausible. So you can go that way if you like. The difficulty is, of course, and apart from the difficulties I've already mentioned, sometimes both possibilities will be coherent, both, both will actually make sense, and that won't therefore help you to figure out which one is the correct reading. The more rigorous way to think about this is to look at word order. And this, I'm just going to get out the pen, um, this is one of the um, situations, we noticed this again in a, a previous video on participles, where word order does start to make a bit of a difference. We've said before that word order in Greek isn't as critical as word order in English. For example, in English, it's only the word order, really, that gives you what's the subject and what's the object. In Greek, word order doesn't really matter so much for that because you've got case markers to tell you. In Greek, however, word order does matter sometimes. And here's an example where because the object comes here and not at the end over here, it's more likely that it's the object of the verb that comes before it. To put it another way, it's pretty unusual for uh, the accusative object of a verb to come before a verb. If it does that, it's because the writer is trying to make some particular point to draw attention to the object. Um, uh, the, the one who sent saves him as opposed to saving somebody else, for example, or to emphasise the object in some other way. In ordinary circumstances, you generally put the object of a verb after the verb. Now, obviously, that's not a general rule. You'll be able to find examples where it doesn't do that, but I'm telling you the kind of general case, and it certainly applies here. And what that does is it provides you an extra little bit of evidence, along with the kind of sense of the sentence, um, to support the conclusion that really what we've got here is a sentence that says, the one who sent him saves. The one who sent him saves. And that's how you should translate it. That's what Duff's put at the back of the book. It makes more sense explains why this is in front of that verb, because it's next to this participle that it's connected to. Now, just one point about um, this. How have I translated this participle? I've translated it sent, sent, not sends. And the reason is, you might think, because it's an aorist participle. And what I'm thinking here is that the aorist participle coupled to the uh, article is more likely to convey a sense of something happening before the main verb than the present participle. So given that, it's more likely that it's the one who sent him saves rather than the one who sends him saves. If you wanted to say the one who sends him saves, you'd say pempone here, not pemp sass. 
I hesitate though to make too much of a big deal out of that because just from experience and just reading the New Testament in Greek and uh, other things later in Duff, it doesn't seem to me that it's a completely cast iron rule that you can read uh, a participle with the the article in quite that way. Some of you guys might have stumbled upon this uh, video and you, you might have a lot more experience of teaching Greek at a much more advanced level. Maybe you could put some, feel free to shout out in the comments if you've got any insight on that. Um, it strikes me as the kind of thing that's probably debated among scholars, but it's not something to worry about at this stage. Um, just notice that what we've done here uh, makes sense of the sentence. That's how you should translate it. Okay, let's look at um, question two. We got it right here again uh, in Duff's book, just to illustrate the point I'm making about participles. Number two, Makarios estin hoblepon ton theon. Makarios estin hoblepon ton theon. And what have we got here? Well, as always, first thing you do, uh, find the verb, there it is, and it means um, he or she or it is. So there we are. Um, and then you're looking for a noun in the nominative, which will be the uh, subject. And what you've got, and uh, nouns in the nominative, you have something in the nominative here, but this is an adjective in the nominative. This means blessed. Um, come to that in a minute, Makarios. What have you got in the nominative that's a noun? Well, you've got another ho here, big fat article, shouting and screaming, noun, noun. Uh, yeah. And what comes after it? Goodness gracious, here we go again. It's another verb stem. Must mean, therefore, that if it's coupled to this, it's a participle. And there we are. The present singular nominative ending. Blepon comes from the verb blepo, meaning I see. So this is the one who sees. That's the subject. So the one who sees is, and now what else have we got in the sentence? Well, um, you've got ton theon and you've got makarios. So what are you going to do here? Let me tell you what some of you will do and I'll tell you why it's wrong. You'll think you've done the verb, you've done the subject, now we find an object. And where's an object? You're looking for a noun in the accusative. Oh, here's a noun in the accusative, ton theon. So we've got the one who sees is God. Now, why would that be wrong? Just take a moment and tell me why it is. Um, the reason that would be wrong is because estin does not take an object in the accusative at all. It takes, one, two, three, shout it out, it takes a complement in the nominative. So this cannot be the object of estin because estin just doesn't have an object. So what does ton theon go with then? Well, it's obvious, I'm sure you've seen this already, just as we've got in the previous example, this participle has an object. It is the one who sees God. The one who sees God is the subject, is, complement, makarios, blessed. The one who sees God is blessed. Now here, back on the subject of word order again, um, we have an example where um, in Greek you can very comfortably put the adjective, the complement of the verb first and the, the nominative afterwards. Um, we kind of do it in English a little bit. Again, think of the um, Beatitudes, Sermon on the Mount. Um, you'd have blessed are the meek. Blessed is the complement. The meek is the subject and are, of course, is the verb. Um, it's uh, a little bit unfamiliar though sometimes in English. In Greek it's very much more common. Uh, the way that Duff translates it in the back is, is to say the one who sees God is blessed but if you got blessed is the one who sees God that's completely right and and actually for what it's worth I and I suspect uh, lots of other teachers as well would favour that translation just because it preserves more of the Greek word order without doing violence to its sense in English. It's my own preference if you're translating things. Okay, but there we are. There's a couple of examples. Pretty simple. Um, again, participles tend to freak people out because there are a lot of variations in it. But once you start to see an article next to one, uh, well, we're going to get lots of practice later on. We'll do the exercises and you'll start to see that it isn't too difficult to work out um, how to um, structure that in the sentence. Okay, next up, we're going to do some exercises at the end of uh, this chapter, chapter seven. Uh, do carry on with the vocab. Just a couple of minutes a day is really, really worthwhile um, uh, on the vocab, along with the 20 or 30 minutes a day, five or six days a week that you're already doing. And then we'll see you in the next video. We'll have you reading the New Testament in no time at all. God bless. Bye for now.